about central banks, and uh, and I think that um, I think that sometimes uh, we believe that the purpose of cryptocurrency is primarily to uh, avoid inflation or the various vicissitudes of what central banks might do uh, with the money supply. Uh, and I'd like to suggest that actually, if we look at the history of cryptocurrencies, which goes back well before Bitcoin, all the way to 1982, David Chalm's blind signatures for untraceable payments, and even further back to the late 60s, uh, with some early conversations that are worried about electronic fund systems, we'll find that really what cryptocurrencies are about is privacy and custody. And of course, that's what distinguishes Monero from many of the other cryptocurrencies. So let's talk about money, cash. Of course, you're all familiar with it. It's really great. But there are some problems with cash. First of all, now that we have the internet, we have internet commerce, e-commerce. People are making transactions away from cash over the internet at a distance. Also, we have point of sale businesses that don't accept cash. Where I come from, London, there are many cafes and pubs that don't take cash at all, or at least that's what they claim. And I'm inclined sometimes to say, well, maybe I'll just leave the cash on the bar and you can decide whether to call the police. <laughs> now, cash is really great, right? It has many different properties that are useful. It's fungible, most importantly. Uh, it allows strong privacy and anonymity for consumers. And yes, it is institutionally acceptable. And yes, we do have an institutional process around it. But it's in decline. Right? And I mentioned London, but London isn't as far along as, say, Sweden, where the central banks and, and indeed regulators have to prop up the use of cash infrastructure to make sure that we have financial inclusion. Uh, but of course, the decline of cash means not only that people don't have possession and control of the assets that they use to engage in the economy, but that, that custodians of these assets are transformed into gatekeepers, right? I mean, how many of you have landed somewhere after making a flight and then you try to go to the ATM or you try to purchase something and you get declined? Why? Why? because some payment network said that that money really isn't yours and you needed to ask permission? That's a problem. And yes, it's a problem for central banks too, because they're concerned about making sure that they're in control of the money. And if you're spending, I don't know, um, the coin of some commercial bank, that might be an issue for them. So indeed we find that the modern payments are a panopticon. And I'm, I'm sure that all of you know this. And I just wanted to, to, to introduce you to this quote by uh, Paul Armour, who was a, uh, a researcher at the Rand Corporation in the 1970s. He said in 1975, if you wanted to build an unobtrusive system for surveillance, you couldn't do much better than an electronic funds transfer system. And that's exactly what we've built with debit cards. This was 47 years ago. So what, what changed? <laughs> and let's just be really clear. People have used assets in their possession and under their control to engage with the economy for thousands of years. But now, de facto, with card payment networks and various mechanisms that enforce compliance rules on banks, now we're actually being surveilled with all of the transactions and profiled. And if we say that we can take away this right from individuals, well, that's just not going to happen. So I'd like to suggest that Banks in general, and central banks in particular, are actually not the enemy. These groups actually do care about privacy. Actually. So let's see if we can actually work together to find a solution that works for institutions. So what we're proposing is a government-issued electronic token that actually allows you to hold value outside of accounts, and you can exchange value without reconciliation because it's actually a token. And importantly, the system is run by independent private actors. Now, these could be banks, could be other kinds of institutions. But the point is that it's not run by a central point. 
And this decentralization pre prevents really two things. It prevents the rules changing without people accepting this change. And it also prevents tampering with history. And most importantly for consumers, it protects consumers by privacy by design. And we have chosen to make the system so that not both parties are anonymous, but one party is. Payers, consumers are anonymous. Recipients don't have to be anonymous. If you think this sounds a bit like a new tailor, well, there are some things in common with that. But let's get to that in a moment. Um, what we've discovered in our research is that we need non-custodial wallets, and we need the wallets not to be identifiable. And we know that there have been some proposals, including in the European, uh, in, in, in the European Commission, the, uh, the EI-DAS-2 regulation suggests that maybe we should issue um, digital, uh, 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 personal digital wallets to individuals. Well, of course, the problem is if you issue them or if you require registration, they can be recognized. And if they can be recognized, they can be profiled by seeing their successive use. And of course, if individuals can be measured, they can be managed. If they can be managed, they can be owned. But the problem is not AML, anti-money laundering regulations at banks. The problem is not about peer-to-peer uh, -peer transactions. These are red herrings, if you will. The problem is about profiling consumers. It's about keeping track of consumer spending habits. And that means that we need a way for consumers to spend money without revealing any metadata about those transactions, without linking their identities to their spending habits. And we can use privacy-enhancing technologies for that, including the kinds of privacy-enhancing technologies that Monero uses. So what we've discovered is we can do better than David Chalm's proposal for blind signatures for undraceable payments, by the way. Uh, so. Actually, David Chalm has done some work with the Swiss National Bank, uh, uh, developing uh, a system that is very much like GNU Taylor and perhaps the foundations for some of it. Uh, this uses blind signatures to provide verifiable anonymity, which is highly private, but it has some, it has some problems. Um, one problem is that it's highly centralized, uh, and that means that we actually don't have independent actors running the protocol and, changing the pro and potentially changing the protocol. Uh, and what we really need is for the assets themselves to be held in non-custodial wallets, and we need these assets to be unforgeable, stateful, and oblivious, meaning that we need people to be able to spend these the way that they spend cash. And we can actually, as it turns out, uh, deliver this in a manner that's different from a classic UTXO system by separating the token issuance from the DLT consensus. And we can do that and when we do that, we can actually avoid requiring the issuer to maintain a database of all of the assets, and we can avoid involving the issuer in the hot loop of all of the transactions. And we do this by, by having a, an institutional system, a, a public permissioned DLT system, uh, and the ability for individuals to withdraw money into their non-custodial wallets and then spend them later the same way that they would do cash. That's the idea. And indeed, by separating consensus from token issuance, we can avoid much of the transaction cost. So we don't need anything like gas in the Ethereum world in order to conduct transactions. We can actually, we can actually build this, this structure called a Merkle try, which can reveal, the, which actually binds a uh, uh, location in the tree to, uh, uh, to its hash, basically. Uh, and this means that we can specify both the transaction and the location of the next transaction uh, inside the hash that's put at one location in the in that ultimately gets percolated up into the Merkle tri root. Uh, and what this means is that someone who's collecting all of these transactions doesn't need to know anything. It just consumes hashes and emits commitments. And these commitments prevent it from equivocating. And, and that is what provides integrity and uniqueness. In this system, we actually we actually uh, actually have the user create their own assets from scratch using a template. And then all they need to do is get a signature from a minter uh, in order to validate it. So the first request involving their, uh, involving their bank is just to request a, a signature and debit their account, request a signature, and then they get a blind signature that they use to validate their asset. And then they have an anonymous asset that actually looks very much like cash. And when they, go, and they want to go to spend it, they give it to a merchant along with a proof of provenance 
that, that allows the merchant to know that the consumer has spent the asset and transferred it to the merchant. And the merchant can verify this offline and everything is fine. Now what's nice about this is that all that we depend upon is the relays in the system not equivocating. And we use the distributed ledger to externalize those commitments and force them to not equivocate. And that's all that, and that's all that it is. It's actually a very lightweight system that makes use of, of DLT for what DLT does best, which is externalize commitments and force everyone to have a common view of history. And in fact, we can do this by transferring possession and control at the same time, or, or assigning control first and possession later. And that's sort of like buying a rail ticket. You can spend it offline if you've purchased it in advance, and you can do both. And uh, here are some references, and feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about the work that we've done. And I also wanted to say that we're hiring. So if anyone wants to be a research fellow at, uh, at UCL in London, please feel free to apply. And you can send me email with, with uh, requests for information. And yes, you do need to have a PhD in a relevant discipline, uh, but we think that this is very exciting. And, uh, there are, and we're going to build something really great. And we're working with central banks, and we're working with financial consultancies, and we're going to make this be private electronic payments for everyone. Thank you.